When we talk about the region we live in and the trade and security challenges that Australia faces, so often the focus is on China, and that's understandable. China is, of course, reshaping the global order. But we shouldn't overlook what's happening perhaps closer to home, across Southeast Asia more broadly. Australia does more trade with Southeast Asia than the United States or Japan. It is a rapidly growing region, both economically and strategically, we're so often told. Our future lies in Southeast Asia. The Albanese government wants to strengthen ties, and from Sunday, a special three-day ASEAN summit will be held in Melbourne. So what's it all about? What can we expect from this summit? What should Australia be trying to achieve? And... What do we need to know about the dynamics in Southeast Asia at the moment? That's what I'm keen to find out more about in this Insiders on Background chat. And there are a few Australians who know the dynamics of this region better than Gary Quinlan. He's a former ambassador to Indonesia, former High Commissioner to Singapore. He was Australia's permanent representative to the United Nations and a former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, amongst many, many other prestigious roles. (laughs) Gary Quinlan, welcome to you. Thanks for having a chat. Uh, Thanks very much, David. You miss the most important and prestigious thing. Um, When on my first posting in Dublin as a junior diplomatic brat in the 1970s, dare I say, I was named the Irish Country Women's Association Man of the Year. I have never quite scaled those heights again. I hope you got a plaque or something framed on the wall. What an achievement. Anyway. Let's, um, Let's start with a bit of context here about ASEAN. What is it? Um... What's its history? How's it evolved? And why does it matter to Australia? Yeah, look, the shorthand... I mean, ASEAN is Southeast Asia. It's all the Southeast Asian countries now. Mm. And uh, Southeast Asia is vital to us because it's the same strategic ecosystem, not just the neighbourhood. It's more hard-edged than that. It actually is the same strategic ecosystem. Look... ASEAN, it's 10 member states. It kicked off with five in Mm. the late 1960s, 1967. As an anti-communist group Basically, in the Cold War, anti-communist. Remember, the wars in Indochina were underway. Mm. You had an aggressive China under Mao Zedong, uh, sponsoring and uh, encouraging revolution uh, in in Southeast Asia and parts Mm. of uh, the immediate region. Uh, You had the actual standoff, if you like, between the United States and Russia. And, of course, China was there as a unique, Mm. separate sort of series of issues in those days. Uh, You'd just emerged from Indonesia under Sukarno having confrontation, as it was called, confrontasi, Mm. against the new Malaysia, which was being formed and emerging. And we had Australian troops committed to help Malaysia in that in North Borneo. It was quite diplomatically nifty that we managed to maintain good relations with Sukarno at the same time as having troops deployed against him um, to help the Malaysians. So it was a very volatile, very combustible environment um, uh, that changed. And in the 1970s uh, and into the 80s in particular, I mean, the wars in Indochina had finished, the Cold War had turned into a different dynamic altogether, um, and uh, China was changing. Mao Zedong had gone and China itself was uh, was changing. So ASEAN um, started to focus more on its own future intrinsically, generating its own future, largely through economics. Mm. Security, sure, and political uh, issues remain important, but it was a largely economic focus, which they thought would be a way to build up their own uh, resilience. Uh, and and ensure that they had diplomatic leverage then politically from that strategic economic weight uh, to be able to look after themselves in the future. I mean, and they brought in the Indo-Chinese and uh, Brunei in 84, I think, and then the Indo-Chinese beginning in the 1990s, early 2000s, and Myanmar, of course. But... And, then, and then you've got an ASEAN plus three that's now become an ASEAN plus six, and that's where Australia comes in. We're not an ASEAN member, but where, how would you describe our relationship? Yeah, uh, and we, we, we were the first country to formally engage with the new ASEAN in 1974. We obviously engaged with it, but we formalised uh, uh, an agreement, a relationship which was called a Dialogue Partner, capital D, capital P. And with that went political exchanges and a whole series and rafts of, a, of areas of cooperation to help them succeed in what their objectives were with economic growth and social development, because that 
was a direct national interest to us mm. in seeing our own in, uh, region grow and become successful uh, and be able to mediate differences between themselves as they arose. So this was quite a vital interest to us. Um, and uh, we, uh, we've remained their oldest dialogue partner. Um, 2021, we concluded a new arrangement called a Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Uh, this is one of the first two such uh, diplomatic arrangements, if you like, uh, with between ASEAN and other countries. Uh, we were one day ahead of China. <laughs> right. um, and uh, ASEAN have now got uh, these same uh, comprehensive strategic partnerships with um, Japan, the United States, India, and one is coming through the network, I think, with uh, South Korea. Now, people say, oh, you know, comprehensive strategic partnership, this is what diplomats talk about, isn't it? It's some sort of fancy term. It's more than that. It, it is the umbrella for a lot of operational activity, but it's countries or organisations in countries defining to each other the importance of the other one mm. and then signalling that to everybody else. A show of respect. Respect. As well as tangible yeah. benefits. Benefits and saying we're important to each other and we want everyone to know that. Mm. So strategic mm. messaging is involved. So then you've got these uh, this special summit that's uh, starting from mm. Sunday for three days in Melbourne. It's not the first one. Correct me if I'm wrong. The original one was your idea. Oh, it was. <laughs> when <laughs> that I was back was, in 2018? Uh, 2018. Uh, the idea was late 2017. A uh, small team in, in foreign affairs and trade. Uh, we were looking at how we could uh, upgrade relations with ASEAN. Right. Um, uh, yeah, just just give it a bit more oomph. And you thought, what, let's invite them all here. Yeah, let's invite them to Australia. And people thought, oh, God, you know, that'll take forever. Will they agree? Well, they agreed in record time. Did they? Malcolm Turnbull was Prime Minister and took to the idea with gusto, and it went ahead. And it was a great success. I'm not just saying it was a great mm -hmm. success, because the ASEANs thought it was a success in addition to us. Why do they... Th I mean, this is always interesting. We can debate how much we're interested, focused... Um, on, on Southeast Asia, but how, how, how do they view us? Yeah, look, I think people said to me, why do you think they accepted this and mm. accepted it so quickly? It was because it met their interests to show in a circumstance where the strategic you know, situation in the region had changed. We all know what we're talking about, the emergence mm. of China, which was inevitable. Um, but, you know, you hedge about that and uh, about behaviour and everything else in the region and you try and build up your own resilience. Uh, and ASEAN was very much in, in, in the uh, stakes of doing that. It saw that as the opportunity for them to showcase a close relationship with their oldest partner, Australia, mm. Mm. Um, which is not actually a member of ASEAN, but which is right there in the same strategic ecosystem to the south. But it's also Australia, a very well-known, very close ally of the United States. Yes, yeah, indeed. I, I'm, I'm just wondering how ASEAN works as a grouping where there are different views when it comes to the US presence in the mm. region and China. I mean, you've got countries like the Philippines and the president of Philippines here today has just addressed the parliament. Um, they're engaged in this pretty aggressive territorial dispute with China over disputed waters at the moment. But then you've got other members, Cambodia, Laos, who are much closer to Beijing. So, so how do they view the strategic contest in the region? Yeah, look, people say, oh, look, ASEAN is non-aligned. Sometimes people say, oh, they're neutral. Well, they're not neutral. Hmm. Slightly different meaning to non-alignment. Um, but ASEAN uh, is non-aligned because that gives it the power to be a sort of mediator, if you like, diplomatically, mm. by not sort of declaring themselves, you know, along the fault line US or China. And why would they? Because they're in the region and, in fact, they need good relations with everybody and particularly in the economic uh, sphere and all mm. the rest mm. of it. But they know what the changes are. They make very similar calculations to ourselves about what that strategic change is and what the implications are for them. And the implication for ASEAN is they want to make it more resilient. That means they want more partners. And non-alignment actually is more subtle. It really means that they want what we want. That is a new strategic equilibrium, balance, where restraint um, you know, can be uh, imposed or developed, if you like, 
because the fact there are a lot of different points of light and it's not just all about the US-China, although that's the fundamental binary, of course. They're not, they're not worried about our relationship uh, with the United States now. They, they understand that. What about AUKUS, that. though? Do they, how do they AUKUS, feel about AUKUS? Um, you mentioned the Philippines. The Philippines yeah. um, publicly said that this was a good thing and it reflected the fact that the strategic circumstances in the region had already changed. Mm. So but Indonesia? To, Indonesia um, was sort of... Indonesia made some comments particularly about, oh, is this going to provoke an arms race or make an arms race worse? Um, that's a natural thing for them to say. Secondly, they said, is this in some way going to uh, complicate the non-proliferation treaty in uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty, which it's not, but that led us to make sure very publicly we reinforce the guarantees that whatever happens with AUKUS, um, that it in fact will be consistent with the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty and also the nuclear free zone that the ASEANs and the South yeah. West Pacific have themselves declared, uh, Treaty of Rarotonga and others, which we support and all the rest. So, in a way, there was a, an element of strategic clarity which came out of uh, that opposition. If you look at Indonesia, uh, the foreign ministry in Indonesia were concerned, you know, on the politics of non-proliferation and arms race. But the defence people, including the defence minister, Prabowo, who is the future president, yep. he saw it as an, a development in relation to Australia's resilience, making Australia a stronger partner. Interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the same as his attitude to US uh, marine deployments in Darwin. So he's a bit more pro... AUKUS than maybe even Jocko would own. I wouldn't say pro AUKUS, right. but understand, but very sympathetic to what our strategic aims are and how right. we're pursuing them broadly. All you can of them. See what Australia's and doing and, and is and doing, why. and he sees what our strategic intent is. And Miles reassured him about this, Just uh, Richard Miles, the other day. Well, I'll, I'll come back to Prabowo because I, I want to get yeah. a sense of how his arrival as president is going to change um, change on, on the marine deployments. Yeah. By the way, I mean. They, the Indonesians, a few years ago under Widodo and Prabowo, were indicating, OK, that's fine. Can we participate in the training and exercises as well? And let's do really? something on disaster management in particular in the region. What did Australia say to that? Um, well, we're, we're working on that kind of right. thing. COVID disrupted everything, of course, okay. uh, and what have you. But that's something you but think that's, we that could see. That is a shift. That see is Australia, a shift. US, Indonesia joint training for both security and disaster relief. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and and use, using um, some of the deployments, mm. you know, in Darwin. Now, when we do joint operations anyway, you know, with the Indonesians in last year, yeah. invited um, the United the United States, Indonesia, it's Indonesia, United States, do a big military operation mm -hmm. every year for years called Garuda Shield. Last year, Prabowo invited 11 new participants, including us, for the first time. We even used tanks, first time we've used them um, uh, offshore from Australia since the war in Vietnam. Um, we all participated, and it was an uplift, and it was not just army operations, as they had been in the past, but air force and maritime. So below the radar, so to speak, there's been a little bit of a shift on the security side. And there is still a, a role for tanks, uh, it turns out. <laughs> anyway, that's another discussion. Um, this Coming back to this summit that's about to take place in, tanks, in Melbourne. But... <laughs> open up that one. This summit in Melbourne, what does Australia, what does the Albanese government need to get out of it, or is the very fact it's happening the real achievement yeah look it's it's certainly a, a real a real achievement that it's happening and it's the second one and it's mm. great um, it's uh, and it's all the ASEAN leaders uh, I understand uh, with the exception Except of course Myanmar. of Myanmar yep. um, and that's that's complicated we'll come back to that too, but, yeah. but um, uh, so it's all of them it's uh, it's it's quite a, a hullabaloo because it's it's uh, next Wednesday is the leaders meeting and a leaders retreat but it'll be preceded on the two days before with a series of other sort of conferences involving mm. uh, leaders and ministers, depending. Some leaders will be involved, others um, won't. But, you know, there's a CEO roundtable to really talk seriously about what we can do um, to upgrade the economic relationship. It's getting Australian businesses to invest it's getting, in the region, exactly, isn't it? Exactly. Rather than the other way around so That's much. right. Very much so. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the big So we'll report, see what comes out of that. We'll see what comes out of that. Um, pretty well structured. I, I, I looked at the program yesterday and I thought, well, that's pretty well done. It's going to be chaired uh, in a practical sense um, by Nicholas is there, Moore. Is there a final communique from the leaders? That, there is. And is much stock 
put in that? Yeah, uh, yes, because it'll be negotiated. It'll be drafted by the current chairman of ASEAN, and that's Laos. So issues like South China Sea... Well, this is the thing, Ukraine, right? Ukraine, Gaza... Australia uh, res respects and accepts the finding of that 2016 uh, International Tribunal ruling on the South yeah. China Sea that... The, the disputed waters were belonging to the Philippines, not China. But the ASEAN as a group has not gone that far. What are they like? Where are they likely to land on, yeah, on that? Look, the, I mean, the ASEANs in particular, in all the sort of statements they make on these things, not just with us but with others, there's a, there's a, a big emphasis on maintaining the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes to the Philippines arbitration case against China. And then all the principles that they set that have to happen in respecting mm. uh, how you settle territorial disputes and all the rest in the region, um, they won't go further in, into operational sort of pronouncements mm. about uh, what you might do to tighten up your mar uh, you know, marine surveillance and joint operations. No, but would they uh, say that tribunal ruling needs to be accepted? Um, that's an interesting point. I think probably no. I'm just mm. trying to recall whether they've actually ever said that. They've talked Don't think they around have. it, yeah, and they haven't actually said it. No. And a, a, a good part of the reason for that is the inevitable one, that when these things are negotiated, you've got Laos and Cambodia in particular mm. um, sort of not wanting to upset China, who's and it's their a strategic model, benefactor, it? and so, it's consensus. Yeah. Um, but, look, this thing will be negotiated um, uh, and, you know, circulated among leaders, and you'd expect uh, some pretty pretty good common language about the strategic aims both of us have in the region and appreciating the kind of change you've got in the and region. And what about on Myanmar? Um, they're not here, of course. This is the, the greatest human rights crisis really in the region is what's still unfolding, what are we, three years now since yeah, the, the, yeah. the coup. Uh, the military um, junta there, I mean, what would they say in the statement, do you think? Or what should they say in the statement about dealing with that regime? I think I mean, ASEAN in 2020, well, after the coup, um, uh, Widodo chaired a conference in Jakarta where they adopted a so-called five-point consensus, a plan. Um, you know, cease host it's bad, cease hostilities, uh, humanitarian access, uh, we'll appoint a special envoy and you receive and deal with our envoy and you've got to have a dialogue mm. within the country to settle this. Now, all of that is unexceptionable. I mean, you can't disagree with any of that. Mm. And the junta um, has simply said, well, um, bugger off. Yeah. We're simply not interested. They've got a little bit of licence to do that because in the initial stages about Myanmar, Thailand were mm. protecting them and Thailand was a military government. Um, and Thailand was very worried about the potential flow of people across the borders yeah. into it. Malaysia had similar worries about refugee flows, so was not as um, strong in its support of the uh, five-point plan. Um, and Laos was sort of caught in between uh, and tried to keep its head down a bit uh, but uh, and went along with the consensus. But not a great deal was done quickly to try and instrumentalise that. It mm -hmm. took a long while to appoint a special envoy and then work begun. But frankly, I think they could have pushed a lot harder on the humanitarian access question to use that as a point of leverage, point of entry. Could they do that in Melbourne, do you think? Is that something you'd... They could certainly emphasise... Look, I have no doubt the five-point plan will be uh, reinforced in the statement and agreed, because mm. it should be. It's a question of what leaders in ASEAN are prepared to say about anything new they might be able to do. I mean, Myanmar's protected in the Security Council on this by Russia and China. Right. There are two yeah. strategic benefactors and China's really engaged. Myanmar's falling apart at the moment. Two-thirds of the country is in conflict physically and there have been a lot of battlefield losses over the last six months. So they're under pressure, mm. which has led a country like problem. Thailand to actually back away from its earlier position, really, and now be trying to find some way to get ASEAN to help right. resolve so ASEAN it. ASEAN might be able to do something that the UN Security Council cannot, yes. and that's put some pressure on the regime in Myanmar. Yeah. Um, and the only real powerful shift in dynamic potentially could be, given the fact that the military are in a mess on the mm. ground, mm. Um, and do in some way, you would think, in a reasonable world, try and look for 
a point whereby they could try and stabilise it in their interests. But it's it's going south for them and relatively quickly. So just on, on this summit, we should look out for what the wording is on Myanmar, um, the South China Sea potentially, what happens on the sideline with trade, investment yeah. agreements, uh, business getting involved more in Southeast Asia. They're kind of the three Yeah, things very to much so. I mean, there's a couple of other side conferences. There's emerging, what's called emerging leaders, you know, the young yep. um, emerging leaders programs that we have with ASEAN countries and ASEAN, which is great. Over, what is it? It's well over, well over. Yeah, over half the population in ASEAN are below the age of 35. Wow. Their average age is 30. Ours is 39, by the way, in Australia. Yeah. These are the new leaders, and leaders who are part of a contemporary technology world, you know, um, particularly in the digital economy and all that kind of connectivity, which is very big in ASEAN, as, you know, as underwriting economic integration. There'll be conference on green energy, um, uh, side conference and, you know, climate, that sort of thing. Uh, I think there's one on maritime cooperation, and um, I, there might be one other, but and I think that's the range. Right. Oh, there's one on small and medium enterprises, which is both a conference and a what they're calling a marketplace with businesses from ASEAN and Australia showcasing what they can do to actually see if you can mm. achieve some progress. And businesses can go to them, Australian businesses, and say, well, how do we get into your market? Yeah, a lot going on. Just finally coming back to Indonesia and how mm. the landscape um, is potentially going to change uh, with the, the new president. He's not the new president yet, but the uh, preliminary count certainly indicates that yeah, um, yeah. uh, Prabowo Subianto is well and truly ahead. He's, he's on track. What, I mean, you, you touched on earlier, what can we expect from this new Indonesian president? Is much going to change? Look, he certainly committed... Um, to continuing with Dodo's um, policies. Mm. Not legacy, but policies. And he was clear to talk in those terms. And, of course, the vice presidential running mate is uh, Widodo's son, mm. you know, Gibran, who's 36 and all the rest but of it. But a strong young, link there. But yeah. a very strong link there. And, that, and people say, well, what are those policies? Well, those policies are economic development, economic development, economic mm. development, which is why the relationship with China is so interesting, because... You know, below the radar, the sort of strategic sense by Prabowo and all the rest of it is more sympathetic to um, the sort of, let's call it the West, and engagement uh, right. with the West in the security domain in particular. But they need um, a strong relationship with China for obvious reasons in trade and investment and yeah. economics, and it's their biggest trading partner, as it is for us. And that's the and case across the region, right? Exactly. China is and China's now partner. the biggest investment uh, uh, partner in... in, in um, uh, Indonesia as well, including uh, with direct implications for us for their support for the nickel industry mm -hmm. and downstream processing, which over the last two years with the massive Chinese investment um, has cut off the nickel market globally, has seized it, lowered prices dramatically, and our own nickel industry has suffered uh, quite fundamentally as that. So there'll be a lot of the economic policies of Widodo that um, he says he wants to continue implementing, and particularly on infrastructure, He's an economic nationalist, um, and he'll continue all of that sort of stuff. Is he committed to democracy? Um, look, he's not a natural Democrat, but then, um, you know, we have a perspective for here in Australia because we're one of the great democratic nations yeah. of the world in history. I mean, you know, secret ballot was Australia in 1856, three British colonies. So, yeah, so, not be a, so all of that, we look at it a bit differently. It's not a liberal democracy, and uh, most countries in Southeast Asia would never be liberal democracies as we understand them. Mm -hmm. The question is, are they credible electoral democracies? And Indonesia is. Um, there might be some at the margins. Uh, there might be some complaints about irregularities and so on. And that's working its way, by the way, now through the system in Indonesia. There are complaints by the defeated parties that, oh, you know, Widodo and government helped Prabowo and mm. so on too much. And there was some funny business with some registration through the new data platform and everything else. Um, there's the, uh, the threat by... Um, Megawati and the defeated, um, uh, her defeated party, one of the candidates, um, the former mayor of central Java, uh, governor, uh, to bring this to the parliament when it's constituted, because elections have been held for the parliament as well. Mm. Um, but, and, you know, so be it if that happens. But the, the margin uh, of the victory 
that uh, Widodo has, uh, that uh, Prabowo has had, is clearly so substantial mm. that it would, uh, even if someone said, yes, there's a, a couple of percentage points that really uh, it's not going to there, be a problem. it's not yeah. going to be, uh, not going to change anything. Look, I think we, uh, he under Prabowo understands us, um, understands us well, and sees us value our value to them and he understands what we're on about in our own strategic calculations about the region. Look, he's a bit unpredictable, of course. Yeah. Um, I spent some time with him when I was ambassador up there a day. I spent with him on the ranch, uh, which he has outside of Jakarta, and really? talked to him a lot. Of, uh, you know, this is now. What's on the ranch? Oh, well, he has the headquarters of his political party, Gurindra. Right. That's where he trains all the young cadres. I was, I was, and, I was picturing horses. Oh, cattle, no, uh, horses everywhere. Okay. He, in fact, he invited me to go riding with him. I couldn't do it um, because the elections had begun, the last ones, 2019, right. and I said, you're a presidential candidate. I, I no, can't do that. No. Anyway, this is not about me. It's about him. And But I had uh, good talks with him uh, that day about Australia and particularly uh, going back to our early history at independence, which he's familiar with, and I gave him a whole sequence of photos from that period to remind him of Australia's how strong mm. we were the strongest supporter of Indonesian independence in the 1945-49 period mm. uh, and in fact represented Indonesia and Sukarno in the negotiations through the UN to achieve that yeah. God, it's, it's so much more we could explore but I, I do feel far better informed about both uh, the mm. Indonesian uh, political change but uh, also the um, the, the, the dynamics within ASEAN, a, a, a young and exciting demographic uh, and an evolving yeah, so, one yeah. as well. Gary Quinlan, thank you so much uh, for sharing your mighty yeah. knowledge on Daniel, this region. Please, I really gosh, appreciate uh, it. I mean, I hope I didn't disappoint. No, <laughs> right. not at all. Not anyway, at all. thank no, you for the really, invitation. It's great. Really, to, really Australians don't think exactly. enough about ASEAN. They think only of the US-China issues a lot and a few there. others. There's a hell of a lot more out there yeah. happening. And US-China for us depends on our uh, the success of all of that, depends on our having much more resilient relationships with the others, and ASEAN are central to that. Indeed, There's absolutely indeed. no doubt. Thank you so much yeah. Thank for you. all of that. Look, we'll be uh, talking about this more on Insiders on Sunday, and I'll be back with another On Background Chat next week. Bye for now. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.